Good evening, everybody, rabbis, teachers, family, and friends. Thank you so much for joining us this evening in memory and in merit of Lior to hear the always inspiring Rabbi Pesach Kron. Shlomo and I are committed to hosting excellent speakers in honor of our Lior. We greatly appreciate all of you who come to remember Lior, to support our family, and to learn from great minds blessed with ter tremendous charisma, able to encourage our inner flames and renew that spark in all of us that helps us be our best selves. One of the many things I love about Lior is that she was always her best self. That is not to mean she always worked to her potential or that she was never upset or an overly dramatic teen or that she was, it means that she walked the high road and led a moral life. She always made us proud. Her kindness, her sensitivity, so sophisticated for her age, continues to inspire Shlomo and I today. Life was a lot of fun with Lior. She was happy, always had a sense of humor and a great sense of adventure. A broken bone could not keep her from hiking in the woods or going on every ride in Hershey Park. She could not be dissuaded from the scariest roller coaster, the highest rock wall and zip line, or swimming with sharks, though not lethal ones, very scary at least to most kids. Lior was a doer. Just yesterday, Shlomo said that Lior made life so exciting and pleasurable, and keeping up with her meant living a lively, dynamic life. Every Sunday, Shlomo used to bike close to 20 miles with Lior. Every Friday night, they took long walks together. And when Shlomo didn't walk with her, I did. She and I were very close. So often she would invite me into her room to talk, tempting me by offering to confide fun personal feelings that I was curious to know. I really miss those talks, snuggling together. Just being with her felt good. Our home brimmed with laughter, music, dance, gymnastics, and lots of chatter. Lior's friends, playing games, making strange food concoctions, dancing, acting, singing, Lior not caring that she was off tune. Her self-confidence allowed her to share her vulnerabilities and weaknesses and help others to feel comfortable. Of all her relationships, two of her most meaningful were with her brothers, Joe and Aiden. Though the three of them are very different, they loved being together and always made time for each other. Of course, they could be very silly together, sharing absurd antics and playing practical jokes on one another. But Lior was also a wonderful role model to them. And they looked up to and listened to her. She always took care of them, making sure they ate, were happy, and so much more. She had a box of prizes in her room for Aiden, and he earned a prize as a reward for good behavior. This system was very helpful to me, and I could use it now. She used to read to Aiden at night. So often he would fall asleep in her bed. She and Joe did so much together. They did karate together. They did hockey together. They played game nights. They learned to bike ride together, went to every park together. He still mentions her strategies in different games, and we all miss the energy and vitality Lior brought to everything. Lior used to take on different mitzvahs and encourage all of us to join her. Before she passed, she was working on sharing her brachas by reciting them out loud, giving others an opportunity to reply amen. In Parshas Balotcha, which is read around the time of her yurt site, which was last Sunday, we learn about the menorah, a powerful symbol of light and illumination, reminding us to share our light. Today, in merit of our Lior, our light, who burns so bright in her short life and serves as our family's symbol of light, we are raising funds for two excellent institutions, Yeshiva Har Torah and Yeshiva University High School for Girls. Please help us by contributing, for one brightly burning flame can kindle thousands of others. A special thank you to all my friends who offered to help me today. You know who you are. A special thank you to Dan, Sila, Leia, everyone who helps me every year. And most of all, a special thank you to everyone who remembers Lior and does mitzvahs in her name. May her neshama have an aliyah, and may our mitzvahs also bring about the coming of Mashiach, because I am so ready. 
These few words that I have shared with you today cannot possibly sum up all that Lior was and continues to be. No words can convey how we ache for her. There's no way to express our boundless love for her. And so without further delay, our keynote speaker of the night, Rabbi Pesach Krohn, renowned Moel author and lecturer, will speak on attaining Simcha Sachaim in difficult times. I'm deeply grateful to Shlomo and Aliza for inviting me on this very, very special night, which is surely painful, but hopefully will end up very inspirational. It's a great covet for me to speak in front of three Rabbanim that are here tonight that are just so beloved by all who know them, Rabbi Salnika, Rabbi Menchel, and Rabbi Bieler. I've had connection with them over the years, and for them to be here tonight is also a covet for the neshama of Lior. All of you here know that I am a male. As a matter of fact, if you want to know how nicely my clients come out, take a look at Joe and Oded. I missed Aiden because that was Shabbos. But as a male, I can tell you that many, many times I have the opportunity to speak to parents about the importance of a name. And I always tell them what the Gemara says, Shema Garim, your name has an influence. Because your name really defines you. I mean, just this morning, I had a bris in Manhattan, and these parents literally, every day of the past week, they changed what the baby's name was going to be. And finally, Friday, before Shabbos, I called them, and they said, don't worry, we'll tell you on Sunday, but it's probably none of the ones we discussed. <laughs> And that's exactly what happened. I came to the Brist this morning in Manhattan, and they named the baby Shiloh. Now, in all my years as a male, I don't remember ever naming a baby Shiloh. And I said to them, I am so thrilled, because the Gemara in Sanhedrin, according to one Mandiyama, says, Mashiach's name is going to be Shiloh. Could you imagine on my resume, I did the Brist on Mashiach? <laughs> I couldn't thank them enough. But there are three other Mandiyamarim who say different names. But maybe, never know. But the truth is, when you think about the name Lior, Lior means, I have light. And that was really the definition of what Lior was about. Not only the light of her smile, the light of her friendship, she was so beloved by classmates, by friends and family. And what I can't get over is what a seventh grade teacher once said about her. The seventh grade teacher said to Eliza, you know, your daughter is the whole package. And what he said was so interesting. He said, you know, I am sure over the years I have taught girls that are smarter than her. But she is the whole package. Not only intelligence, but wit and kindness and friendship. And that's really what we want our children to be. And what a nachas and what a schus to be able to say that they had a daughter like that. But tonight, that idea of Shema Gorim is really going to be effective on all of us. Because tonight we are all going to become Lior. We are all going to become those people of light. And tonight what I hope to do is to enlighten our lives and brighten our perspectives on something that was so important to Lior in her life, and that was to achieve Simcha Sachayim. In the graduation book, which I just saw, she wrote that she wanted to live a life of smiling and be happy and to give that over to others so they would pass it on to others. And Simcha Sachayim is something that all of us desperately need, especially today in such difficult times. And Really, it is such a challenge today, unfortunately, because of so many, many problems that we hear about and that we are challenged with. But I want to tell you something amazing. I remember the very first time that I had to speak on the topic of Simcha it was many years ago. Rav Shimon Schwab was still alive. And I would call him. He answered the phone himself all the time. And I would tell him, you know, I have to speak on a particular topic. He would talk straight. 10 or 15 minutes, and then he would say, okay, I think you have enough. So I remember when I told him about Simcha, 
He said something very interesting. He said the Mishnah in Masech the Megillah that we all know, Mishnichnas Adar Marbim Besimcha. That when Adar comes, we increase our Simcha. And he said, isn't it interesting? The same Mishnah tells us, Mishnichnas Av, when the month of Av comes, Mematin Besimcha, we minimize our Simcha. Now, even though that's the saddest month of the year because we commemorate the loss of both Bat and Migdash, but it doesn't say that in Av there's no Simcha. In Av, we minimize our Simcha. But a Yid always has to be the Simcha. In Adar, we increase our Simcha. And in Av, we minimize, mematim b'simcha. But a Yid always has to find something to be happy about. And then he gave me an example. Now, anybody here under 20 will have no idea what I'm talking about. And that's a pilot light. I asked my granddaughter recently, do you know what a pilot light is? She says, isn't that in the airplane, the lights by the pilots? So, of course. But Rav Schwab was right. A pilot light, for those of us who remember, was on the oven. It was always on. When you cooked, it was elevated. When you didn't cook, it was minimized. But the pilot light was always on. He said, that's what simcha is. A person always has to find something that they can be happy about. And I remember I spoke to the Novominsky Rebbe at that time. I just happened to see him and I told him that I have to speak about Simcha. And he said, listen to the Posik that Shlema HaMelech tells us. Lev Sameach Yetiv Geya. The Posik is a Mishle Yudzayan Posik of Beis. A happy heart is the best tonic. Veruach Necheya. But Chas V'Shalom, if a person has a broken spirit to Yavesh Gorem, it dries out the marrow of the bones. So tonight what we are going to learn is not only emotional stability, but also health stability. Because that's what Shlema Melech is telling us. A happy person lives longer. A happy person has a better life. And we all know, any doctor here can tell you. And even people in Atzala like many, right? So anybody can tell you that two people can have the same illness. But if one person is happier than the other and has a more positive attitude, he's going to heal quickly, more quickly than the other person. And so therefore, that's why it is such an imperative for all of us to learn how to attain Simcha Sachayim. So I want to tell you a fascinating Gemara. The Gemara is in Tainus Chav Bez Amar Aleph. And every time I have to speak about marriage, I bring this Gemara. The Gemara tells us Rav Broika was walking once with Elio Anovi. And they see two people coming towards them. And Elioh Novi whispers to Rabroika and he says, You see these two guys? They got a straight ticket. They're going straight to the Olama Emes. And Rabroika was surprised. He didn't know these guys are such big tzaddikim that they're going straight to the Olama Emes. So it's interesting. He waited until Elioh Novi left, al Heretz, because after all, if a tzaddik, a godel is with you, so you don't talk to somebody else. But after Elioh Novi left, Rabbeika goes over to these people and he says to them, "My what do you guys do? I didn't know you're so special." So listen what they said. They said, "Inchi anan, we are happy people. atzivi, we make those that are sad, we make them happy." Imagine if you have the capacity to walk into a room, you have the capacity to go over to somebody and make that person who's feeling miserable, feeling down, you can build them and encourage them and make them feel special. You got a straight ticket to the Olama Emes. That's what they did. They made those people that were all saved, that were sad, they made them happy. But the Mamloye says, let's watch what they really said. They didn't just say they make people happy. They had a comment first. They said, we are happy people. We make others happy. Why did they add that? And he writes like this. He says, that which they said, that which we are happy and we make others happy, comes to teach us. You want to make somebody else happy. You want to make your spouse happy. You want to make your children happy. You want to make your co-workers happy. You have to be a happy person. And he writes, If they would be negative, sad people, Even if you want to make your spouse happy, but you're a negative, nasty person, you're never going to make your spouse happy. And the same thing is within the classroom. 
If a teacher is not happy, he's not going to make the students happy. And if parents are not happy people, they'll never make their kids happy. And if a spouse is always looking at the negative and always criticizing, they'll never make the spouse happy. So tonight we have to learn how to be happy ourselves, otherwise it's hopeless. We'll never make all the people around us happy. So how are we going to do that? And especially, today we have so many problems, health problems and financial problems and shidduchim problems and children problems, family problems, marriage problems. It doesn't end. How are we going to change it? So I'll tell you a number of ways how we can become happy people. Rab Chaim Velozhin, and many of you know, was the prime Talmud of the Vilna Goyen. And he wrote a sefer called Nefesh HaChayim. It's a very difficult philosophical sefer to learn. However, the introduction, he didn't write it, his son wrote it, Rab Itzel of Velozhiner. And in the introduction, which is very easy to read and understand, Rab Itzel of Velozhiner says something about his father, Rab Chaim. Listen to this. He says, my father used to rebuke me Many times when he saw that I didn't get involved with the problems of other people. This is what he told me all the time. This is what man is all about. And all of us should have this on our bulletin boards and our schools and our kitchens. These three words. You are not created for yourself. God did not give you talents that you should become rich and famous. Every one of us, and I know many of you, are blessed with certain talents. Every one of us has a different mindset. Every one of us can accomplish in different ways. Hashem didn't give us those talents only for ourselves. And if we stop living only for ourselves and start taking our talents and our heart and our time and we give it to others, all of a sudden you're going to become a different person. And I want to tell you a magnificent story that happened just a few weeks ago. A few weeks ago, I got a call from a couple in New Jersey, and they were both very frightened. And they said, Rabbi Kron, we need chizuk, we're frightened. And I said, what's going on? And they told me, the husband was doing most of the talking, he said, my wife was on the phone, she's expecting, she's in the ninth month, and in three weeks, she's supposed to give birth. So I said, so what's so frightening? That's such a happy occasion. And he says, Rabbi, last year she was also expecting. And last year she was also in the ninth month. And everything was going well. And we went into the hospital Friday afternoon. And Friday night, she had a stillborn. And the baby was not alive. And it was so devastating. It was so shocking, not only to us, but to the doctors. Nobody could believe it. And we were absolutely destroyed. We were, were, were looking forward to our first child, and then that happens. And we just are so frightened. We're just so frightened that it shouldn't happen again. So, Rabbi, could you give us some encouragement? Give us some idea. Tell us something. Now, I'm positive I'm not the only one that they called. But I said to them, I'll tell you what I think that you should do. And I told them both to take out a Tehillim. And I told them they should look at Kapitel Kuf Chav Zayin and Kuf Chav Ches, 127 and 128. And I said, let's read this paragraph together, this chapter together. And I showed them, in Pasuk Dalet, it says like this, Chichitzim biyad gibor, like arrows in the hand of a strong person. Cain b'nei anorim, that's what children are all about. In other words, a strong man can shoot an arrow from here, but it goes very far. Same thing, a person raises children in one community, but when they get older, they can go far all over the world and accomplish. And then the next Pesach says, Hashem bonim, The heritage of God are children. And then the next period, Kuf Chav Ches says, Eshtecha, your wife, Kegefen Peria, will be like a fruitful vine. Bonecha, your children will be Keshesile Zesem, like olive shoots. I said, in my humble opinion, what both of you should do is every day from now on, until the end of the ninth month, both of you should say this kapitlach. Say kuf chav zayin, say kuf chav ches. And I want you to give tzedaka to an organization that services children's needs. Whichever one I could give you um, a suggestion, but you'll find your own. Amit Hashem, everything will be fine. Fine. Three, four weeks later, the guy calls me back. 
He says, Rabbi Kron, do you remember who I am? And he tells me who he was. And he says, Bor Hashem. Well, the second he said Bor Hashem, I knew it was good. He said, we had a girl. And I said to him, you couldn't have had a boy? No, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. But, and of course, I asked him, you know, the girl's name and all. And then he says to me, Rabbi Kron, I want to tell you part of the story that I didn't tell you last time. And he says like this. He says, we were in a hospital in Long Branch, New Jersey. And right next to that hospital is a shul that I attend sometimes. He said, I told my wife Shabbos morning that I want to go daven in shul. By the time I came to shul, they were up to laning. And the famous singer Yaakov Chueki was getting an aliyah. And the reason that he was getting an aliyah was because he had had a girl a few weeks before. And that Shabbos, they were making a big kiddush for him. He said, you could imagine what we felt, what I felt like. Here I come from the hospital, baby was not born alive, and now I come into shul, and everybody's celebrating that Yaakov Chueki had a baby girl. He said, it took all my strength, but after davening during the Kiddush, I went over to him, and I said to him, just mazel tov, I wish you lots of mazel, you should have nachas and brocha. And then I said to him, do you mind after the Kiddush if I could speak to you for a moment? And he said, no, f- for sure, whatever you like. And after the Kiddush, he goes over to Yaakov Chueki and listen to this. And he tells him the story that last night they had the stillborn. He says, my wife asked me to ask you, do you mind if we would come to your house tonight <laughs> after Shabbos and sing for us your famous song, Mama Rachel Cry." Nobody sings it like he does. And he said, we have to cry it out. And we know that if you sing it for us, it'll mean so much. And he said, of course, come no matter how late you get out of the hospital tonight. Come, and of course I'll sing it. And of course you could understand, those of you I've heard the song, the words, Mama Rachel, cry for us again. Won't you shed a tear for your dear children? If you raise your sweet voice now as then, the day will come. So this tzaddik, Yaakov Chueki, who gets thousands and thousands of dollars for his concert, that night he sings it for them. Not only that, the fellow told me he sang for them Rachem, which means Hashem should have compassion, and they're all crying together. And he gives them CDs, and he gives them albums, and he makes them feel so special. And they go home uplifted. Well, when he told me this story, I said, I've got to tell the story. This is amazing that a person should be so selfless. This is his profession. And he goes and he's singing and he asks and he invites them to come to his home. It's so beautiful. But I can't do it without his permission. So I call him up. I had a cell phone. And I said to him, I just heard this great story about you. I really want to use it. I have a recording that I make three times a week about the importance of doing chesed. I want to record this, and I want to print this. It's such a beautiful story. Listen to how a tzaddik talks. He says, Rabbi Kron, I'm just afraid. He said, everything that I do, I do because I hope that one day I'll get reward in Shemayim after 120 years. I'm just afraid if you make it public and everybody knows about it, I'm going to get less reward in Shemayim. I don't want to get less reward in Shemayim. I said, Yaakov, you're a bigger tzaddik than I thought you were. I mean, that's amazing, but I want to tell you something. I said, Yaakov, why do you do what you do? Because guys that are older than you have been doing it for years. Guys like Mordechai ben David, guys like Avram Fried and Shlomi Dax. They've been going to hospitals, they've been going to sick people, and they do what you did. You learned it from them. If you let me tell the story and people find out about it, others will learn from you. And that's going to be your reward in the Ilama Emes. He said, okay, Rabbi Kron, you can tell the story. But the point is, look at that. Imagine his Simcha Sachayim. He took his talent, he made people that were so broken, he made them feel special. And that's really how you can feel special. Think of the talent that you have and use it for other people. I want to give you another example. Many of you heard of Rabbi Mordechai Gifter, who was the Rosh Hashiva of Tells. So this goes back a number of years. He was flying out of LaGuardia together with his rabbits and with his wife. They were going back to Tells in Cleveland. It was the last flight out of LaGuardia. And as he's about to get on the plane, he sees there's a bachar from the yeshiva that's trying to get on the flight. 
The boy didn't have a reservation. He was hoping that he would be able to get on standby. And sure enough, there were two seats left, and the boy got on. Now, in those days, when Rab Gifta was alive, which is, you know, 20 years ago, they were still giving kosher meals on flights. So, th- during the flight, the stewardess comes over to the young man, to the bocher, and gives him a kosher meal. He's an Erlich boy. He's an honest kid. He says, uh, ma'am, I appreciate it very much, but there's no way that this could be my meal. I didn't even have a reservation. I didn't reserve a kosher meal. And besides, I just got on standby, so they can't possibly be my meal. She says, young man, you're right, but the rabbi told us to give you his kosher meal. He said, the rabbi? How could I eat the rabbi's kosher meal? He goes over to Rabbi Gifti, he says, Rosh Hashiva, I thank you so much, but how could I possibly eat your kosher meal? And Rabbi Gifti says, young man, I want to teach you a lesson. He says, you see, I'm traveling with my Rebetzin, with my wife. No matter how late we get to Cleveland, I'm going to get supper tonight. <laughs> By the time you get to the dormitory, the kitchen will long have been closed. You're going to go without supper. I just wanted to be sure you have supper. That's a Rosh Hashiva. What would I think the Rosh Hashiva is thinking about? Probably what Shiri has to give tomorrow. That's not what he's worried about. He's worried about that kid in 28B, whatever, who doesn't have a meal, and he's going to make sure. That's what it means living for others. You want to hear what it means living for others? You could go crazy at this story. I just heard this story a while ago. There was a man in Washington Heights, 90 years old, who never passed away. Him and his wife never had any children. She was also about that age. And not only that, but he was the youngest of all his siblings, and all his siblings had already passed away. So the only one that was sitting shiva was his wife. And a woman, Mrs. Rita Slamwood, so I know, she went to be Menachem a few of her friends that age, they came to be Menachem And then while they're sitting there and talking, all of a sudden a middle-aged couple from Borough Park walks in. Nobody knew who they were. They sit down and they start asking the new Almana questions about her husband. And she's answering then at the, you know, in the middle of the conversation, she says, excuse me, did you know my husband? She said, no. She said, I hope... I hope you don't mind my asking. You didn't know my husband. I don't know you. You don't know me. What are you doing here? <laughs> Listen to what they said. You could faint. They said, we get the Hamodia every week. And the first thing we do, we look at the Misaskim list. If you ever saw the Misaskim, it tells all those that are sitting Shiva. He says, when we see anybody in the metropolitan area that's sitting Shiva alone, we go to Menachem Oval. Could you imagine? Mika Amcha Yisro, what a thought that there's somebody out there sitting Shiva alone and they're going to go even though they don't know that person. Because if a Yid is crying alone, they're going to go to be Menachem Oval. That's what Jews are all about. That's what it means living for other people. I'll tell you one more story and then a suggestion that we should do here in this show. A couple of weeks ago, I was out of town at a bar mitzvah. So the father got up, he says, I want to tell everybody a story about my son. I'm waiting to tell everybody, family and friends. He said, here in Waterbury, all the kids travel by bus to yeshiva. Ten bus stops. Every station has three, yeah, about eight, nine kids that get on the bus. He said, my son gets on the third stop. Usually eight kids are on the, that station. But that day there was only seven. My son gets on the bus, and then as he's walking to the back of the bus, he sees through the big window that that eighth kid is a block away, and he's running to make the bus. So he yells up front, tell the bus driver not to move because that kid is coming. Now, the bus driver either was in a bad mood or a nasty fellow, and he said the kid should have been here on time, and he takes the bus and he leaves. Well, so the father is talking about his son. He says the next station, my son got off. Because what happened was when that boy saw that the bus was leaving, he started running faster and he tripped and he fell. So my son got off, he said, to walk back with that kid so that boy won't have to walk to school alone. And when all the boys on the bus saw that he did that, they run up to the bus driver and they say, hey, listen, you've got to stop or else you've got to make a right turn, a right turn, a right turn, pick them up and take them to school. And that's exactly what happened. And he said, I'm very proud of my son that he was sensitive to that kid who fell. And when I heard the story, I was very proud of that boy because that boy is my grandson. (laughs) 
but what I'm trying to show you is that even a 13-year-old boy can also learn to be sensitive to others. So I want to tell you a suggestion. I didn't ask Rabbi Salmika, so please be Michael, but I just want to tell you something beautiful that happened this past summer in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Last year I was called to speak on a Sunday afternoon and they had what's called Shabbos Kehila. Now, in this shul, which is called Beis Chinuch, the Rav who came up with the idea is a Rabbi Ari Friedman, who's the assistant rabbi there, and he came up with this idea. Everybody on one particular Shabbos either was invited to somebody's house or invited other people. Nobody ate alone in the whole shul, but nobody could do the inviting because everybody's going to invite their friends. So there was a fellow who was designated in the shul who knew everyone. He was the one. He decided who invites somebody else. And everybody in that Shabbos Kehila was invited. What a way of achdos. Wouldn't that be beautiful that we should have a Shabbos, make it up sometime in the winter, next year, next winter. L'zecha nishmas, right? L'yod dvora bas rab shlomo. That that Shabbos will be Shabbos Kehila. That everybody should invite somebody else. And it won't be that you do the inviting. No, Shlomo will invite everybody, right? right I'll give you a job, right? I mean, you may have to dive my Rabbi Kellimer afterwards, but whatever. But uh, whoever will do it. But the idea is, what a great idea. What a beautiful idea. And I'll tell you another idea that I think that we could do. L'zechan nishmas lior. You know what the Chavetz Chaim says in Sefer Avas Chesed? Every single day. He says every day you have to do a Chesed for somebody else. Every day you have to learn something and every day you have to do a Chesed. And what I would propose is that each and every one of us should have a little notebook. And every day you do a Chesed for somebody else. Not a husband, a wife, a wife, or a husband. That you got to do if you know what's good for you. I'm talking out of the house. And then all of a sudden, you'll see. I guarantee you, you do this 40 days in a row, you'll see that your life changes. How do I know? Because Dovod HaMelech says, Hashem, Tzilcha, God is your shadow. You do for others, others will do for you. Let's get a little notebook. And right on the front, we'll say, L'zeichen nishmas, liot vora basrab shlomo. And every day you do it. Even if you do 10, you only write down one. And I'm telling you, you will see that you'll become a different person. And everybody will be able to do a chesed. And what an act of unity that will be in West Hempstead. What an act of unity that will be in the Kehillah. That's really beautiful. And that will be exactly what she lived for, to do chesed for others. And when you do chesed for others, that's one of the ways how you get Simcha Sachayim. I want to tell you now something that is not easy to listen to. Just by a raise of hands, I'm just curious. How many people here ever heard of the name Risa Rotman? One person? Maybe. Let me tell you who she is. Do all of you remember, of course you remember, that horrendous morning in Harnof, that horrendous morning when Rabbi Tversky and three others, Nebuch, were killed, and that Druzy policeman was also killed. Horrendous, horrendous. One of the worst days in the history of Eretz Yisrael. But what most people don't remember is that Risa Rossman's husband, Chaim, was a fifth one who was maimed that day and rushed to the hospital. Now most people, no matter what the tragedy is, except the family, most people forget about a tragedy after a while because there's always something else to talk about. But for Risa Rossman, this Gehenna went on every single day for a full year. And when I came to Eretz Yisrael to speak in the Binyanei Oma last summer, somebody told me that she wanted to speak to me. I went to her house in Harnof. She had set up cake and coffee. It was very beautiful. And she started telling me that she was writing a book. She was writing a book, what it meant to go through that year and Nebuch eventually, her husband, passed away. But she told me something else that also broke my heart. She also had a 14-year-old boy that was killed in an accident. He was coming home from yeshiva, from Bayad Vagan, 
Somehow he was driving the mountain route on the way home. Nobody knows if he was hit by a car or he just skidded off the side of a mountain, a cliff. She told me they couldn't find him for hours and then they found him, he wasn't alive. So not only did she lose a child, but she lost her husband. And we were talking about the book that she was writing for Art Scroll and she knew that it was gonna come out Hanukkah time. And she asked me about the title for the book, if I had a suggestion. And I gave her a suggestion, but then when I came back to New York and I spoke to Gedalia Zlotowicz, who took over for his father, Rav Meir, and he said there's only one title for the book. And that is Terra and Amuna in Harnof. And this is the book. Terra and Amuna in Harnof. And I'm telling you that if you want to achieve Simcha Sachayim, one of the answers today is Amuna. To read a book like this to show what faith is. Now, I want to show you something and tell you something that she writes in this book. Many people, she told me, said to her throughout the year, as her husband was in the coma, aren't you in limbo? Right? Just like hanging in the air, waiting for something to happen one way or the other. Listen to what this Sadekis wrote. We will get such a perspective of what life is all about. No, she said. There's no such thing as limbo. Jews are never in limbo. Whether they are waiting for a shidduch, a baby, or any other Yeshua, they are exactly in the place they are meant to be. To do their avodas Hashem. This is the place where I'm meant to be at this time to serve Hashem. And that is true for all Jews at any time, any place in their journey. What a way of life. Today, Tremendous books have come out on Amuna. This book, Living Amuna, is the second volume, but they have three volumes already. A young Sephardi fellow, David Hashir, has written these books. They've sold, I think, over 100,000 copies, the three of them. Get this book, Living Amuna. You will have such a connection to Hashem. As a matter of fact, he told me, David told me, that a lady wrote him, and she said, learning about Amunah can be so soothing. Things that used to bother me don't affect me at all now. I don't worry as much. I'm overall a calmer person. When a person understands that they have trust in Hashem, that sometimes we go through Gehenna, we go through a challenge, but that's where we're meant to be at that moment. And God is testing us and seeing how do we react to Him, even in difficult times. Who started this whole movement of Amunah? Rabbi Shalom Arush, he wrote a book called The Garden of Amunah. Without exaggeration, this has been translated in 20 different languages. It sold over a million copies of the Maggit books gezokt. <laughs> right? But the point is, when a person has Amuna, when a person learns what it means to have trust and faith in Hashem, then they're no longer angry. If a person doesn't feel that they're in limbo and they realize for whatever reason it had to happen. Listen, I didn't want to lose my father when I was 21. I'm the oldest of seven children. I was thrust into the profession of being a moil. My father was a moil. When he realized how sick he was, he made sure that I learned how to become a moil. That's not what I thought what I was going to do in life. Maybe I was going to be a moil eventually, but certainly not at 21. And certainly not to walk down all my brothers and sisters to their chuppah together with my mother. But when a person is in the moment, not worrying about what happened and not worrying what's going to be, but right now, how am I going to connect to Hashem? And the answer is, if a person begins to read books about Amunah, all of a sudden, they're a different person and they're living a much more calmer life. Now I want to ask you a question that probably nobody ever asked you before, and maybe you never thought about it. What is your favorite bracha to make? You ever think about that? Think about it for a second. I have had some great answers that I put into my speeches. I see you talking, Good. Well, what's your favorite bracha? Yeah, you, the young lady right here. Tell me, what's your favorite bracha? You wanna tell me? Don't be embarrassed. You're not on video. Anybody want to call out something? You know what? I'm t- what is that? 
Shechiano, that was my favorite. That's until, until I prepared this talk. Shechiano, on the first night of Sukkot, if you're sitting in a Sukkot in Eretz Yisrael, Leisha Basukkot and Shechiano, I could never say it without crying. You're right, Shechiano and Leisha Basukkot, that combination in Eretz Yisrael is the greatest. I was in a camp, I don't want to say which camp this past summer. I asked the kids this camp, this fat kid gets up and says, Bring him in the I said, I believe you. <laughs> I love the answer of two women. One woman said, Lahad Lignesh Shal Shabbos, and another woman said, Shal Sanikit Sainai. Mom is precious. But I want to tell you what I think your favorite bracha should be from tonight on. And that is the bracha of Ashi Yotzah. Yeah. Now I want to tell you something. And I want to tell you why I believe that it should be that way. You see, because all of us have so much to be grateful for. We have a heart, we have a colon, kidneys, lungs. When do we ever stop for a moment and thank Hashem for everything that's going on? Again, to quote Rav Shua, because nobody can say it like he does. When we contemplate the miraculous workings of our various halulim, the cavities in the body, such as the trachea and the esophagus, and the entire digestive system, the respiratory system, and circulatory system, and suddenly, chas v'shalom, there's an unexpected rupture or blockage, we're in mortal danger. You want to be happy? Thank Hashem that you're alive and that you're healthy. When do you get a chance? Stand in one place and say, Ashiyotza. How long does it take? Nine seconds. Do you know what somebody told me after he heard the speech? He said, I put up a big sign. Ashiyotza is not Tfilas Aderach. Right? Because most of us, when we say Asher Yatza, we're walking, we're getting dressed, we're texting, we're diapering the baby, we're doing a hundred things. But that's perhaps one of the most important brachas in the day. And then a lady called me up, she said, you know, Rabbi Kron, you're right, because don't we say, allow me to stand in one place. And not only that, you know what the Vilna Gaon says? You could go crazy. You wouldn't believe it. The Vilna Gaon points out this is the only bracha, the only bracha that we mentioned, Kisei Kivodecha. The, the holy throne of honor in Shemayim. Golav Yadol of Nei Kisei Kivodecha. Not by Shoifa, not by Matzah, not by Megillah, nothing. Why do we mention Kisei Kivodecha? You know why? And the Vilna Gaon says, to tell us, She'afilu of Nei Kisei Kivodecha, Hashem is still mashkiach ala oilam hashofel. Hashem is watching us over every little thing. You want to be a happy person? Think about how grateful you are to be in this community. To have such a wonderful Rav. To have such a wonderful Kehila. We never stop and think about these things. We never stop and think that we're happy and healthy and we can run and do and breathe. I mean, I don't have to tell you, go with Hatzala guys to a hospital, all of a sudden you get a different perspective. Somebody's in a hospital for a couple of days, he comes out, the rest of his life he's changed. We don't have to wait for that. From now on, we have to make a commitment on the bracha of Asher Yotzah. Now I want to tell you something. I shouldn't say this because I'm on video, but it's just too funny not to say it. <laughs> so I gave this speech in Brooklyn someplace. There must have been a thousand women there. A few weeks later, a lady calls me up. She says, Rabbi Krohn, I want you to know, every time I go to the bathroom, I think of you. <laughs> I pray that I'll be remembered for other things besides that. <laughs> Somebody else told me this morning, not this morning, right side, before we, I walked in here, that every time when she davens now, she keeps her cell phone in the kitchen and she, she has it away from where she's davening. So at least, thank God, there's balance. But, but the truth is, really, when you think about it, L'seicha nishmas li'or dvora b'nav shlomo. From now on, we should say Ashiyatza with a little bit more care and concern and kavana. And all of a sudden, you become a different person. You realize that you have so much to be grateful for. I want to tell you one more thing, and then we'll review and end with a great story. As I told you, my father passed away when I was 21. 
So I was very, very close to my mother. My mother, unfortunately, was an almana, a widow, for 40 long years. She never, ever got over the passing of my father. And I have a good wife, as many and his wife know. They lived in Kew Gardens for many wonderful years. And the furthest my wife and I ever lived from my mother was two blocks. We always took her on vacation when we went with the kids. When I went with my wife alone, I'm not crazy. I didn't take my mother. <laughs> right? but, but when we took the kids, we always took her. So, unfortunately, she passed away about seven years ago. She passed away after the second day of Yontif, at the beginning of Cholomite Sukkot. And it was just so unusual because my father died 40 years earlier on Shemini Atzeres. And we start Shiva at the beginning, right after Yontif. And then 40 years later, again, the exact same thing. We started sitting Shiva right after Yontif. But two years ago, my nephew called me up. And he said, Uncle Pesach, I want to tell you something about your mother that you don't know. I said, it's impossible. There's nothing that you could tell me about my mother that I don't know. Because nobody was closer to her than I was. He says, no, I'm telling you, I was the only one that was there when it happened. And I never told it to you because I never understood it. But now I saw something and I want to tell it to you. I said, what is that? He said, it was the second day of Sukkot, the last day of her life. And she wasn't responding anymore. And I came into the room in the hospital. It was in Paul Kimball Hospital in Lakewood. He said, I went over to her and I said, Bubby, I have the lulav and esrig. You want to shake the lulav and esrig? We'll do it together. We'll do the mitzvah together. And she didn't respond. But I didn't know if she understood what was going on or not. But I put her hands around the lulav and esrig and I put my hands around her hands. I made the bracha. It didn't look like she said the bracha. I wasn't sure if she understood what was going on. We shook the lulav and the esrig in all four ways, and up and down as well. And then I was going to take the lulav and esrig from her. But she held on to it tight. She wasn't letting go. So I said to her, Bubby, we did the mitzvah already. She didn't say anything. She just held on to it. She wouldn't let me take it away from her. So I figured, he says, if she wants to hold on to it, why not? So I took my hands away, and the second I took my hands away, she took the lulav and the esrig to her lips, she kissed both of them, and she gave it back to me. I said, I couldn't believe it. Obviously, she knew what was going on. She realized this was a chayfetz, an item of a mitzvah. And I never understood why she did that. And that's why I never told it to you. He said, but this year, he was teaching in the fifth grade in the yeshiva, and he was learning, it happens to be in Hilchas Afi Kaiman of all places, and listen to this. Kosav Shloha Kodesh. The Shloha Kodesh writes, Ra'isi Mebnei Aliyah. I saw higher elevated people. Show you Menashkin Hamatzais. They used to kiss the matzahs. In my life, I never kissed the matzah until two years ago. Last year, me and my grandchildren were all kissing all the matzahs. And Vahamorar. He says, I can't say I kissed the mora. But Vahain Sukkah. And the Sukkah, when you go in and out, just like you kiss the mezuzah when you go in and out, the Shlach Kodesh says, People, you're supposed to kiss the mezuzah when you go in and out. And v'chein, dalad minin shebalulav. The same with the four species of the lulav. You kiss it after you use it. Why? V'hakor l'chavah v'amitzvah. To show how much you love the mitzvah. V'ashrei misha oivet Hashem v'simcha. Lucky are those people who serve Hashem v'simcha. And that's the final way tonight that I want to talk about. Loving mitzvahs. And when you love to do a mitzvah, and you show your children and grandchildren how you love to build that sukkah, or how you love to shop for that esrig, or how you love to do any mitzvah that you do, and you love your chumash, and you love your sitter, and you treat it with care, and you become connected to Hashem by loving mitzvahs. And that's how you get Simcha Sachayim. Because we have so many wonderful things that we can do to show our love for Yiddishkeit, and for Hashem, and for Torah. And when you do mitzvahs, not begrudgingly, but when you open up a sefer, you can't wait to read what's written in that sefer. And when you're driving, you're not listening, you know, to Mike Francesa, who's back on again, right? Those of you who know what I'm talking about, right? But you're listening to TorahAnytime.com. Let's face it, the Yankees are going to win, the Mets are going to lose. What can he tell us, right? <laughs> and Manning is not going to win the Super Bowl again, no matter what he does, right? So I could tell it to you as good as they can. But the point is, 
that if you show them that you love mitzvahs, all of a sudden that's a different type of life. That's a simcha sachayim. I'll tell you one more other story that my son-in-law's grandmother told me. She was a German woman, Oma Roberg. I called her my own Oma, though I'm not German, but she was such a special, regal woman. And she told me that she lived in Stuttgart in 1938. And Nebuch, that was already when Kristallnacht happened and all the Rabbanim were taken out of Stuttgart. Who knows, they went to concentration camps, they were taken away. And she told me she had just gotten married and her husband was teaching in the day school and she taught in the afternoon. So now this was Friday morning. Now at that time in 1938, they were already rationing food. So no Jew was able to get chocolate. You couldn't buy chocolate, couldn't get butter, only a certain amount of milk, and you could only get four eggs a month. So you had one egg a week. That's what Jews were able to get. So she told me, Omar Robert told me, that every Friday she would make a little cake for her husband, Alex, and she would use that egg. And she saved it, Lakovic Shabbos. She made the little cake on Friday. She said one morning, fr- Friday morning, he was in school teaching, and she opens up the egg, and there's a blood spot there. Now what is she going to do? She can't use this egg. And she's thinking, well, you know, the blood spot is only on top of the egg. Maybe I could just wipe it off. Nobody will know the difference anyway. It's not really in the egg. It's just on the surface. And then she's thinking, no, I can't do that. Alex relies on me. He relies on my cautious in the kitchen. How can I go behind his back? She said, well, maybe I'll do it. And when we get out of here, hopefully, I'll ask a rabbi if I did the right thing. If I did, fine. If not, I'll never do it again. And then she said, no, 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 no. Alex relies on me. I can't do it. And so she told me she threw out the egg and she washed out the bowl. And now she had this decision. Should she use next week's egg for this week's cake? Or this week go without a cake? And she decided, look, who knows if we'll even be alive next week. So I'm not going to do it. I'm going to use the egg this week. She washed out the bowl again. Listen to this. You won't believe it. She told me she opened up the egg and out came two yolks. And Omar Robert told me that little message from Hashem to me lasted me my whole lifetime. That message was my daughter. No one knew. No one would have known except me and you. But you were so loyal. I just wanted to give you that little gift to show me, to show you that I consider you a daughter in Kla Yisrael. And all her children and grandchildren, all Yurei and Meshleimim, holy, wonderful, wonderful people. How does that come? That comes because somebody loves mitzvahs. So let's review everything that we said and we'll end with a great thought. Let's remember tonight we all have to become Lior. We all have to become that light of a person that becomes a happy person, that lives a Simcha Sachayim like she lived. How do we do that? One, living for others. Make a spiral, make a little notebook, and write on the outside, and do a chesed for other people. Every day do something. You'll see you'll become a different person. Let's remember, read books about Amunah. That'll give us the strength to go through difficult times. That'll give us the strength to go through challenges. And of course, as we keep in mind the chesed, we remember the story of Yaakov Chweke, and we remember the story of Rab Gifter, and we remember the story of that person, that couple who went to be Menachem Oval. All those beautiful people who live not only for themselves, but live for others. That's how Lior lived, and that's how we should live. Let's remember... To say Asher Yotza. And remember that we have to be so grateful that we're healthy. We have to be so grateful that we're alive and that we could accomplish. Everybody has challenges, but anything can change. Let's remember to say that bracha. Let's remember to love mitzvahs. And when you love mitzvahs and you feel a closeness to Hashem, that's how you gain a simcha sachayim. I just want to end with this fabulous story. A couple weeks ago, in Flatbush, there was a father and a mother who made a suda saido. A suda saido means a thank you suda. And what happened was they invited all the family and friends, and the father told this story. 
that in Flatbush there were four guys who grew up together. They went to the same yeshiva. They all got married the same time, lived in the same neighborhood, davened in the same shul. And every year in the winter break in January, they would go down and they would go to Florida, to Orlando. They rented a big condominium and had a private pool, a private arcade room. And every year they did the same thing. He said, this year, this past winter, one morning the women decided they're going to go shopping. So the men went downstairs, out to the backyard with the boys, and they were all swimming. And then they came inside, the men went upstairs, and the kids went into the arcade room. He said, my four-year-old, who was playing with the arcade, suddenly realized that my one-and-a-half-year-old boy was missing. He couldn't follow the arcades. And then suddenly he realized that the door to the backyard where the pool is was open. And he runs outside and sure enough, that little boy was in the pool, face down, flat, immobile. And the kid runs inside, he's screaming. And it just happened to be, the father saying, that one of the four of us was coming down to check on the kids who were in the arcade room. That guy was the only one of us who's an Atzala, he's an EMT. And the kid is yelling, my brother's in the pool. The guy ran out, jumped into the pool, took the kid out, laid him on the ground, did CPR, and literally saved his life. Brought him back to life, and they took him by ambulance to the hospital. He said, I just wanted to thank Hashem. I just wanted to thank Hashem for that orchestration. At that moment when my four-year-old was running in, that that kid, that friend of mine, was coming down the stairs, and he was able to save my son's life. That's why he was making the Surah Saidah. When he finished speaking, the wife of the Hatzalah member gets up and she says, now I want to speak. Everybody was wondering, what does she want to say? She says, I want to say part of the story that nobody knows. She says, this year, my husband and I, we weren't going to come because we couldn't afford it. We had a very difficult year in business. And that father, I don't know how he found out about it, but he called me. He called me and he said, listen, there's no such thing that you're not coming because we all go together every year. We're like one big family. The kids love each other. So I'm going to pay for you and for your husband and for your four children. And that's exactly what he did. And he thought that he was doing us the biggest favor by paying for us to come. Turned out he was doing himself the biggest favor because the one that he paid for was the Hatzalah member who saved his son's life. And that's what chesed is all about. And that's what when you live for others, you're really living for yourself. Do we have one more time from one other story? Rabbi, what time is Mincha? 8.10. 8.10. We got one more story. We'll end with a great story, okay? This is one for the books, really. Listen to this. You won't believe it. Last year, my wife and I were for Shabbos in Muncie. And um, Saturday night, I had to go to speak in Lakewood at a dinner, some dinner in, for a yeshiva in Lakewood. So it's 80 miles from Muncie. You get on the Palisades. Those of you know, the Thruway Garden State. Fine. Now, we're getting onto the Palisades. We have my grandson in the car. We're getting onto the Palisades. We're still on the ramp of the Palisades. And all of a sudden, the car ahead of us, the hatch opens up, and out comes a suitcase and a suit bag and a hat box and a crib. Ali Yiddish is right? All the, you know, anything that a Jewish family would have for Shabbos. And my wife's blowing the horn, trying to get their attention, but all this stuff is, they're gone. They don't even realize, you know, what happened. Okay, we stopped the car. We couldn't even move, right? Because everything is on the highway. But thank God it wasn't on the highway itself. It was on the ramp. And we bring it all into the car. So I wanted to see if there's any identity or anything. And then on the outside, I want to teach you a lesson, which I learned that night. I see on the outside of the suitcase is a telephone number. Now, when you are traveling, never, ever put your home number on the suitcase. Because what good is it? You're not home. (laughs) Right? You never thought about that. Neither did I. You should only put your cell phone. What good is the whole number? So I call the number, and this is what I said. This is Rabbi Pesach Kron. I just want to tell you, please don't have any Shalom bias problems. Don't blame each other who left the hatch open. Because I have everything. Nothing is lost. So don't get angry at each other. Just call me back, and I'll somehow I'll get it back to you. I tried to text them. Of course, it didn't text. It was a landline. And so I thought for sure people are going to check in their messages, Garnet, McGarnet. Three hours later, I went to Lakewood. I'm ready to finish a speech. I'm coming back on the Verrazano. I come back on the Verrazano. It's past midnight. All of a sudden, I get a call. A lady screaming on the phone. 
She says, Rabbi Kroll, I can't believe you got all my stuff. I said, yeah, where were you the last three hours? She said, you know, our cell phone is dead, and, and we didn't get home till now, and we got the message that you have all the stuff, we can't believe it. I said, you know, I have everything. It's not a problem. You know, and my wife is a genius. She said, hey, listen, we're on the Verrazano. We got to pass Brooklyn. They live in Brooklyn. You know, we'll bring it to them. She says, Rabbi Cohen, you're not going to believe this. I went to my sister's son's bar mitzvah, and I was so distraught. And I said to my sister, we lost so much stuff. And my sister says to me, if you get all your stuff back, that's a Pesach Road story. <laughs> Could you imagine? <laughs> so, so, of course, you know, we come down East 9th and they're outside, you know, and they're waving and, you know, making sure that, you know, we see them. And, of course, we give them back all the stuff. But I want to tell you the main reason I'm telling you the story, because listen to how this holy woman davened. She said, at the bar mitzvah, I went into a corner and I said to Hashem, she said, I prayed in English and I said like this, Hashem, you know, you know that I never keep anything that's not mine in the house. If I, if I owe a quarter, I pay it back. He said, last week we got a delivery from the grocery. I checked to make sure everything was paid for, that they charged me for everything. Then I noticed they forgot to charge me for the delivery. I went back and I paid for it. So I said to Hashem, Hashem, you know I never keep anything in my house that's not mine. Please make sure to return everything that is mine. And 20 minutes later, we get the call that you have everything. And that's the final way. Davin. Davin Tashem. Anything can happen. Never give up. Always make that connection to Hashem. Live for other people. Let's have a munah. Let's say Asher Yatza to be grateful that we're alive. Let's, again, as we said, love mitzvahs. And in that way, L'zeich Nishmas Lior, Devorah Basra Shlomo, will all become people of light and be able to have a simcha sachayim and be zeichet to see Mashiach in our time. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for listening.